Um, I just want to say uh, welcome on behalf of Bristol Royal Society and thank you for joining us um, for this webinar today. Um, we're hosting this webinar today in associate with, association with Argyle Environmental um, and we're delighted to have a couple of speakers today. Um, Argyle Environmental is a specialist risk management consultancy and part of Landmark Information um, and we are joined today by um, Mark Taylor and Sally Redman. Um, we are waving at you um, <laughs> and I, um, I shall hand over to them uh, shortly. Um, just a couple of housekeeping points before we kick off. Um, the webinar is being recorded. Um, uh, so everyone will get a link to the recording afterwards, um, but obviously please do bear that in mind. And we will be doing a Q&A at the end of the webinar. Um, we have a Q&A function, so that's separate from the chat function. So if people have any questions, um, please put it in the Q&A. Um, and I will uh, now hand over to Sally to uh, kick us off. Thank you. Thank Thank you, um, and thank you for everyone attending the webinar today on climate change in the UK. Climate change describes the warming of the Earth's climate caused by human activity, and if left unchecked, it poses an unprecedented threat to both human civilization and our ecosystems. The UK has seen evidence of climate change already, with temperatures increasing and more extreme rainfall events causing surface water flooding and there will be an increase in the frequency and magnitude of events as our climate continues to change and sea level rise. So just to introduce ourselves, um, Mark and I have been environmental consultants for over 10 years now and we've largely focused on contaminated land and flood risk but our particular interest as well is in climate change and how this is impacting the UK and how we need to mitigate those risks and advise property professionals on those particular risks and how to manage them. I will take you through an introduction to climate change, the impact it has on well globally and the impact to the UK. Then I'll take you through the Paris Agreement and talk about how the UK, um, what actions are being taken to combat our contribution to climate change. Mark will then go um, through about the work done by the task force for on climate on climate related financial disclosures and how um, what action by industry is leading volu and voluntary positive change as well as change on the national policy level. And finally, we'll talk on the uh, specific risks that will require understanding and mitigation for businesses and what we're doing in this particular space. So just to go through the impacts of climate change now. So we have probably all seen this graph before showing the level of carbon dioxide increasing and the Earth's surface, um, the Earth's temperature um, would be minus 18 degrees if we didn't have greenhouse gases. Um, but this increase in carbon dioxide is caused by human activity and our emission levels. And as a such, our temperature has started to increase. Um, and just to talk about the greenhouse effect. So our greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide and methane absorb infrared energy, better known as heat, and then we emit that heat. And um, the earth then absorbs that and heats up the surface. And as greenhouse gases are increasing, their average global temperatures have risen by 0.8 degrees since 1980. And as a result of our increasing temperatures, a number of physical and financial impacts have occurred. And I think we all remember the floods that happened in this winter, um, but also the droughts that occurred on the other side of the world in Australia and the devastation of the Australian bushfires. And I just wanted to go through some of the um, impacts with you. So 18 million hectares were burnt in the Australian bushfire season. And when this is compared to the UK landmass, this equates to much of England from 
leads down to the south coast. It destroyed 5,900 buildings, including 2,800 homes. And in addition to human fatalities, many millions of animals were killed. And this is something that is still ongoing as bushfires caused um, habitation loss and loss of food sources. So it's estimated that over a billion animals will con um, continue to die as a result of that. And also we had um, poor air quality as a result of bushfires and in January 2020, Canberra in um, Australia measured the worst air quality index of all major cities in the world. And the smoke, as we know, is made up of particulate matter, which when um, inhaled into our lungs can result in severe asthmatic attacks, reduced lung function, bronchitis and potentially premature death. And the smoke particles were blown 2,000 kilometres across the Tasman to reach New Zealand, where it also affected their air quality levels as well. And it was classified as a code orange, which means um, unhealthy air to sensitive groups, particularly those who suffer from asthma and have poor lung condition. But there are also economic costs as well. And the fires have caused approximately 84 billion pounds in damages and economic losses. This includes losses occurred by highway closures, production stoppage, power outages, as well as flight cancellation and delays. And one thing that I want to mention as well is climate feedback loops. So until um, this year's Australian bushfire season, the forests in Australia actually um, reabsorb all of the carbon um, it emits when they're doing when we have the bushfires. But because of global warming and it's making these bushfires more frequent and are having greater devastation, um, the Australian bushfires this time emitted 400 megatons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And therefore, obviously, it increases the, um, Australia's annual greenhouse gas emissions and contributes to global warming and therefore increases the likelihood again of reoccurring megafires um, that will release even more emissions into the atmosphere. And it's just this continuous um, cycle that's potentially um, going to increase um, all of our emissions. So just to go through um, the global economic losses as a result of um, physical impacts of climate change. So as these events become more frequent, we are seeing um, this affect the economy. And as we can see here, we've got a number of um, events that have occurred. And we can see that there is a general trend um, that we're increasing our economic losses. And as this continues, people will become more reliant on insurance to cover these losses. And as a result, insurance companies will then increase their premiums. And we don't really know yet how insurance companies are going to change when we have more impacts on climate change. So what's the impact um, on climate change on the UK? So the recent um, climate predictions, which came out in 2018, um, the report provides results of a range of different um, future emission scenarios. So it gives a Worst case scenario where we're continuously using fossil fuels and therefore um, high greenhouse gas emissions. But we also have a best case scenario where global emissions have been increasing, but we reach a peak and they de decline um, towards our ambitious climate targets that have been set by the Paris Agreement, which I'll go through later in the presentation. And the predictions for the UK um, suggests that we're likely to experience hotter, dry summers and wetter winters by 2017. And if you think about the summer of 2018, we had six weeks of um, a dry spell and we had temperatures in most parts of the country that were regularly above 30 degrees Celsius. And these hot summers are expected to be more common. Um, in the past, probability of having a summer 
um, as hot as 2018 was low, so it was less than 10 percent. And the probability has already increased due to climate change and is now estimated to be between 10 to 25 percent. So if we look at rainfall now, um, the report suggests that the average summer rainfall could fall by up to 47 percent by 2017 and the winter rainfall could be up by 35 percent. Now this change in um, rainfall from got high rainfall to potentially having drought, um, this could potentially have an additional effect where we're looking at subsidence. So for instance, clays, which are particularly susceptible to changes in moisture content, we could actually see an increase in subsidence in parts of the country where we're underlain by clay and the BGS are actually looking at this data set at the moment to identify if this is happening. But with the increase in rainfall over the winter period again we can see um, an increase in the flood risk. And also looking at sea level rise we could have a rise of up to 1.2 meters by 2100. Um, and with this also increases the risk of flooding from tidal rivers and along coastlines. And therefore, really, it is essential to be having a flood risk report to identify um, those particular areas that are going to be at risk from future flooding caused by climate change. So here we have um, the spring average temperatures. Um, these are increasing and the UK already um, provides evidence of the impacts of climate change that it's accelerating and are becoming more prominent. So as you can see from this table here, going back to 1910, seven of the top um, 10 warmest springs on record in the UK have occurred already and they're since the year 2000. And if you include 1999, that's eight of the top 10. And while 2020 hasn't been the hottest spring, um, it was the driest on record. So the month of May was the sunniest calendar month since records began in 1929. And in April, we found that that was the sunniest April since records began. So that was looking at the, the spring average temperatures, um, but this decade has also been record breaking as well. So we've had eight high temperature records which were breaking in the last decade. 2018 um, was the hottest summer since records began. Um, July 2019 had the hottest temperature ever recorded in the UK. And then as I've spoken about um, our springs um, this year have been the sunniest um, and the driest. But with increased temperature, we also have increase in water vapour as well, and that also results in more rainfall. So February um, 2020 was um, the wettest, um, was the fifth wettest winter since records began, and that's back in 1862. So just go looking at the impacts and costs and uncertainties of climate change. So we have seen the impact that extensive flooding has had. Um, if we think back to 2007, when we had those devastating floods in England um, and consequently flooded many properties and important infrastructure, the total economic costs of that summer 2007 floods were estimated at around £3.2 billion. And we're actually starting now to see our first climate refugees. And this is the result of sea level rise and our ability to protect towns and villages from inundation caused by sea level. Um, the first climate refugees are in a village called um, Fairbourne in North Wales and is situated by Barmouth Bay, which is only slightly above sea level. And at the moment, um, they are protected by a seawall and an earth bank, and they have recently been improved. Um, as part of a £6.8 million coastal protection scheme. But Gwynedd Council has admitted that it can no longer afford to protect that village from sea level rise. Um, and as a result, um, unfortunately, it will start to become inundated as sea level rises. Um, 
and obviously house prices have started to go down um, and then the only people who are really investing in that town and that village at the moment are cash buyers who could potentially make a little bit of profit from rental and this is something that we're going to start seeing more often um, and a report from the government committee on climate change found nearly 530,000 properties um, are at risk along the English coast and by 2080 up to 1.5 million homes will be at risk of flooding with more than 100,000 homes at risk from coastal erosion. So we're already seeing um, increases in coastal erosion at the moment um, along North, Norfolk and Suffolk where you've got um, soft material um, along the cliffs. Um, so really we, we you will find this more often where only really big towns and cities will actually become protected and will have to unfortunately allow either manage you know manage retreat um, or allow those places to be flooded unfortunately. But we also have to consider how policies are affecting our risks as well. So climate policy and new technologies can lead to transition risks, which is a new concept. We know about physical risks, but transition risks are new. Um, and we will um, and will occur as a result of us moving to a less um, polluting greener economy. And such transitions could mean that some sectors of the economy face big shifts in asset values and high costs of doing business. The expected transition is estimated to require around one trillion dollars of investment a year for the foreseeable future, generating new investment opportunities, but also um, could reduce investments in other sectors such as coal, for instance. And at the same time, the risk return profile of some companies exposed to climate related risks may change significantly as well, because the physical impacts of climate change, climate policy and the new technology. Um, one study estimated um, the value at risk as a result of climate change to a total global stock of manageable assets as ranging from $4.2 trillion to $43 trillion between now and the end of the century. So just going on to um, the Paris Agreement. So on um, 12th of December 2015, parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change reached a landmark agreement to combat climate change and to accelerate and intensify the actions and investment needed for a sustainable low carbon future. And the main aims of the Paris Agreement include strengthening the global response to the threat of climate change by keeping a global temperature rise this century well below two degrees Celsius above pre industrial levels. And additionally, the agreement aims to increase the ability of countries to deal with the impacts of climate change. So the Paris Agreement opened for signature on the 22nd of April 2016, um, which was Earth Day, and um, entered into force on um, the 4th of November 2016, which was 30 days after the so-called um, double threshold um, occurred, which is the ratification of 55 countries um, that account for at least 55% of the global emissions. And since then, more countries have ratified, and to date, 189 countries have ratified um, out of 197 parties to the Convention. So what has the UK done? So on the 27th of June um, 2019, the UK became the first major economy um, in the world to pass laws to end its contribution to global warming by 2050 and the target will require the UK to bring all greenhouse gas emissions um, to net zero by 2050 um, compared to the previous target that we had um, which was at least 80% reduction by 1990 levels. Um, the UK has already managed to reduce their emissions by 42% and just to, to note net zero means um, any emissions that we um, make need to be balanced out um, by schemes to offset the same amount of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. So this could be from, for instance, planting new trees um, or schemes like carbon capture and storage. So I'm just gonna pass you over to Mark now to talk about the task force on climate related financial exposures. Thanks, Sally. Just bear me two seconds while I 
get this up. Um, can everyone see my slides? Sally, have my slides popped up? Yeah, they have. Wonderful. wonderful. Um, so obviously discussions and commitment to change is obviously vital on a global scale if we're going to see any significant attitude um, as to change to fossil fuel use and emissions reduction on the scale that is required to meet you know, the, the very optimistic targets of the Paris Agreement. Um, and while the Paris Agreement was ongoing, um, business and organisations were also meeting to discuss um, what could industry practically do to help achieve um, the very optimistic target. And they met under the banner of what is now called the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures, which was set up by the Financial Stability Board. Um, the TCFD are an industry led group set up in 2015 to help identify the information needed by investors, lenders, and insurance underwriters to appropriately assess and price climate related risks and opportunities. Now, a couple of the goals are listed on the slide, and whilst they're both important, you know, it's obviously extremely important to understand in your recommendations what risks need to be understood and they're going to vary based upon where you are on the globe and what sector you're in however what was crucial to the to the movement that they were making was that what they were recommending had to be practical um to had to be practical to basically ensure that whatever approach they made and whatever recommendations they made it had to be consistent that could be adopted across the market what they didn't want was a fragmented approach to um, climate related disclosures either varying by market or very varying by different organizations within the same same business area so they wanted a nice joined up approach that everyone could follow so that adoption was easy and then comparable um com sorry comparing things like assets or or the market was easy to do the tcfd published their recommendation to, in 2017 and since then they've received significant support um, from leading companies and organizations across the global markets in um, lending, insurance and commercial property investment and wider investments. And what's key about this movement and about, about the task force um, on climate related financial disclosures, it's like typo there in the title, it's on not for, um, was that this is voluntary. These are, these are companies and organisations leading the way in their, in their areas and their sectors um, with an understanding that it's going to take quite dramatic changes in policy, in the way we approach um, emissions to really tackle climate change. Um, and also, you know, an acceptance that you know we are as a business area and as organizations they are contributing to the problem so i'm not going to dwell too much and go into in too much depth about what these recommendations are but effectively there are four key elements of the recommendations from governments uh government sorry to strategy to risk management and then metrics and targets um and this is the graphic that's taken from the tc recommendation document itself and if you want to look at that very easy google search tcfd recommendations um, but what is key about what the recommendations do is they put climate change and climate change risk, whether that's the physical risk um, upon assets or upon business, or whether it's the financial implications of having of having a carbon um, intensive activities, is they put that at the heart of um, the heart of organisations and the heart of business. It's therefore a big change from what was originally the norm. So speaking with some investors in the past, you know, climate change historically has been a nice thing to have and a nice thing to consider. It's not something that's going to have been at the forefront of um, informing investment, um, unlike other risks such as such as like current day flooding, um, obviously the market opportunity. Um, it's been something that's been part of a sustainability team, more commonly seen as ES an ESG team, um, and a nice to have and something to something to, to do to increase profit and reduce spend on utilities and things like that. But with the publication and adoption of the TCFD recommendations, it does now become a fundamental issue. You know, as an issue, climate change can now, well, can potentially have a fundamental impact on real estate value in the future. Um, as a result, climate change risks and opportunities is already being integrated into the investment decisions, um, sorry, the investment decision making process. And that means not, no longer post acquisition, this is, will be at the investment committee level for certain organisations. Um, assessment to how far reaching um, and how important climate change is becoming from a commercial property risk um, can be seen in, in BlackRock's statement. Now, I don't expect, um, I'm not going to reel off this massive quote that um, I got from BlackRock, um, not specifically from BlackRock, but um, BlackRock are the world's largest asset manager with over $7 trillion of assets under management across the world. And effectively, what their position is, is they see the TCFD as the benchmark framework for climate related financial disclosures. But well, obviously that's great you know it's you know having some someone like that of that size committing to 
uh, what you've built and what you're recommending. It also does need, well, the TCFD recommendations do need wider market adoption to have an impact, especially at the UK level. And this is also happening. Um, the BBP, um, the Better Building Partnership, are a collaboration of the UK's leading commercial property owners. Um, currently, there are 35 members, which you can see on the slide. As a group, what they do is they come together and collaborate on ideas to improve sustainability and to improve business management. As a, as a group recently, they've been collaborating with businesses, working together to improve the sustainability of, exi of the existing commercial building stock. And in 2019, 23 of these companies, those highlighted in red, and so 2019, um, these companies signed a commitment to tackle climate change through the delivery of net zero carbon real estate portfolios by 2050. So that obligation and that commitment lines up with the date of the Paris Agreement, but also to the UK's legally binding position to become carbon neutral um, by 2050. Um, some of this might have changed, but the, 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 the boxes in red highlight the companies that, that committed to the initial agreement. Um, these parties that originally committed stand for £300 billion pounds worth of assets under management, uh, which equates to 11,000 properties globally and 1.2 million tonnes annually of CO2 emissions. So this is quite a substantial um, group of businesses committing to making big policy changes to um, the way property is managed from a, from a CO2 emission standpoint. Um, so how does this link to the TCFD? Because that was the focus of, of this section. Well, member organisations who have made the commitment um, in line with the BBP statement um, will be developing and publishing their own climate change strategies to tackle this. Um, this will likely have short-term and long-term goals, as you can see from um, the case study that I pulled off um, Doe at London's uh, website. So in the first instance, it's to publish a net zero carbon pathway by the end of, end of this year. But at the heart of it, again, is the TCFD recommendations, and, it's, and they are planning to develop a climate change and strategy in line with the task force, or climate, the task force on climate-related financial disclosures by the end of 2022. So the, the TCFD recommendations are meant to the heart of business decisions going forward. As another, as another case, um, Nuveen, they're a, commercial, a global commercial investor with approximately $1 trillion worth of assets under management globally, and they publish a policy, policy statement on responsible investment. And within that document, uh, we can see there's a section specifically on climate change, referencing, um, again, the TCFD recommendations and the fact that you know, these risks need to be mitigated and assessed. Um, to fully understand what the impact could be on, on their commercial real estate portfolios. And they, they go with that into further detail about the physical and transition risks, which Sally mentioned earlier, and which we'll pick up a bit later in this presentation. But again, on the left-hand side, you can see we align our approach with the recommendations set out by the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures. So the TCFD recommendations are being an industry-led um, framework and approach is making its way in industry already and becoming quite widely adopted um, amongst commercial property investors. So effectively, these recommendations are synchronising you know, industry's approach to um, climate change risk um, from a risk standpoint of property and from a disclosure of, finance, of the financial impact of that. But alongside this, it is also helping shape UK policy and UK action. And this can be seen from what the contents of the Green Finance Strategy is. And effectively, the Green Finance Strategy was published in 2019 and sets out the government's objectives for meeting its climate change commitments um, which is aligned with these recommendations. Um, currently, UK is setting out expectations for all listed companies and large asset owners to disclose in line with the TCFD recommendations by 2022. So effectively, what the TCFD are set, have recommended, what they're saying in terms of understanding risk is already starting to take place in the UK now. And so the steps that commercial investors are making is preempting change that's probably going to happen in the next couple of years. The other points in this slide are pretty much just along the lines of the government getting, the, getting everything in order, you know, dealing with um, regulatory authorities to make sure that there's guidance and frameworks in place for companies to follow, whether that's banks, whether that's lenders, insurers um, or businesses, um, to be in a position to understand what their obligations will be when these things come to force. Uh, one particular era, area, sorry, the pensions area, um, in March 2020, the pensions regulator launched a consultation on new non-statutory guidance on the risks and opportunities associated with climate change. This is aptly named aligning your pension scheme with the TCFD recommendations. So therefore, again, the TCFD, what the TCFD has said is pretty much going to be um, applied to uh, the government's approach and what their expectations of businesses and markets um, uh, to apply. 
before we d d uh, dive into risks, um, this, the main focus has been, has been on commercial property, um, but banks and insurers have also had more recent um, changes um, asked of them. And there's now an immediate requirement for them to start understanding what the risks of climate change could be on their portfolios. Um, so banks and insurers have already been asked and are required to understand potential climate related financial risks. Um, the basis being that climate change presents financial risks which are relevant to the PRA's objectives, whether that's through physical risks or the transition risks expected from climate change, um, some of which might be opportunities from the transition standpoint. And the focus of this guidance is on scenario analysis. So it's because you know, climate change is to a degree an unknown, um, they're based upon emission scenarios. So as Sally said, you know, it could be a worst case business as usual scenario where we're not committing, well, we're not acting on our commitments on a global scale resulting in um, quite substantial temperature change, or it could be you know, a Paris Agreement world by 2050 where we have done it and we've achieved what we set out, UK being carbon neutral and, and temperature rise limited to two, two degrees or even better 1.5 degrees. But effectively these scenarios differ. And so therefore it's up to um, banks and insurers to, to un undertake these scenario analysis um, going forward. Um, also referred to as stress, as stress testing. But again, that's, that's a requirement that banks have already been doing and actually Landmark through its business Landmark Valuation Services has been assisting with already. So we're already providing services to, to, the, to that market. Um, but looking, looking at risks, so moving back to commercial property, the, TC, the, TC, the TCFD is at the heart of change in the UK based upon what the, uh, the Green Finance Strategy has said. So, what are the risks that the TCFDs talk about? And um, these can be split um, in between to, it's to, to, to four separate risk types. So firstly, you have your physical risk types, you then have your transition risk types, you have reputational risk, and then at the end, which isn't referenced by the TCFD, but will come into play later down the line when regulations and expectations change, you then have liability risks. If we start with physical risk in the first instance, um, clearly from our own experience, um, at the moment in terms of you know, flooding that we see and you know, as part of you know, uh, transactional due diligence prior to acquiring a site, physical risks are a natural risk to property. Um, and we ought to take this as part of, as I said, pre-acquisition due diligence, looking at you know, contamination, flooding, ground stability, subsidence, mining. You know, these are all physical risks to property that need to be looked at. So there, from a climate change perspective, um, how many of these risks could increase over time? And as Sally said, the two key ones probably um, to the UK, the, the, most, the most common one to commercial and resi will be flooding. It will be um, higher precipitation rates resulting in higher runoff and surface water flooding. It will be river flooding, it will be sea level rise and, and, and tidal flood events. So they're the ones that are expected to be um, the biggest impacts impact to the UK. But if we're looking on a global scale, windstorms, um, wildfires, you know, these are all gonna, have, gonna result in um, the probability of these things happening greater on an annual basis. So if we take a flood risk as an example, what effectively businesses may want to start looking at is what is the current risk as they do now that's pretty much standard as as part of pre and due diligence but what is the projected risk you know, if i have an investment cycle of 15 years what will the risk be then but not just that if i'm looking to sell that property in 15 years i'm going to want someone to buy it and if they're the same tolerance as me then i need to be really looking now 15 30 years down the line to make sure that you know, this investment i'm making now is is going to be you know saleable at the value that i, I perceive it to be and that's just simply because, you know, with changing, with a changing climate, with uh, more varied and more extreme weather projections expected, um, risk is expected to increase from these, these types of sources. Um, and therefore there'll be costs with um, mitigating, alleviating, and, well, and also understanding what those risks are. So physical, physical risks as they do now, present an obvious issue to real estate. The second risk that, that Sally's touched on as well um, is transition risk. So effectively transition risk, these are the costs associated with converting property to being carbon neutral. So is it possible to retrofit current property stock, whether that's commercial or residential, um, to being either carbon neutral or more energy efficient with the carbon that it's using? Um, and that's probably more of a short term, a short term task is the retrofitting um, element of it. And if possible, this can be seen as a short term opportunity um, despite investment being required because there will be a requirement for greener building and um, obviously offloading property isn't necessarily ideal nor demolishing to rebuild so as a short-term retrofitting um, green technologies is definitely seen as a plus and this can be anything from solar panels um, to generate energy if you're a warehouse 
a little bit a lower level business park. You might be capable if then there's no barriers in the way, you might be able, you might be capable to um install a wind turbine, it could be air source heat pumps, ground source heat pumps, you know, in, in, installing green technologies to reduce your impact and your carbon footprint. Um, other things that could be relevant are things like uh, rainwater harvesting to utilize gray water as opposed to connecting the mains for all your plumbing. So there's many ways that businesses and buildings can adapt um, to reducing the, the impact, uh, the, the, your footprint impact that you, that you have from um, operating out of it. Um, if a building can't be adapted, then in the long run that could be a problem um, because it could be hard to sell to other investors um, and it could obviously be, you know, potentially be a blight on your portfolio if, if you are trying to achieve a net zero portfolio by 2050. Uh, there are obviously already um, restrictions in place. Um, MEES is something that's come into force, I think, either very recently or very soon, um, minimum energy efficiency standards. But that's already in consultation to be looked at. I think the current standards E, but there's already consultation out there to potentially by 2030 raise that to C or even B, you know, in line with the very ambitious targets the UK government has set um, in relation to climate change. Uh, reputational risk. So in line with change of policy, in line with new targets, um, national targets, investors are, are becoming a lot more conscious of climate change issues and what needs to be done. Everything from external pressures, you know, consumer preference. Um, consumers, you know, vote with their feet and if they don't agree with um, a businesses or then align themselves with, you know, how a business aligns themselves in terms of what their policy is on certain matters such as climate change, then they may be deterred from using that business. Um, and that's a very real risk for businesses going forward. You know, we use the term woke, you know, quite negatively a lot of time for the current generation, but actually in this kind of field where, you know, these are very important issues, you know, understanding what we need to do and understanding the impact if we don't do it, that wokeness is actually very important and it will drive businesses to changing, you know, policy and, and how they approach certain, certain issues. Um, there could also be um, investor pressures, you know, pressures to move away from carbon intensive industries, from shareholders or stakeholders in that business. It may mean changing your supply chain, so maybe cost associated with that, but there may be internal, external, external pressures that if you don't adhere to, could lead to reputational damage for a business. Um, and all in all, if a business doesn't react, um, it may become less desirable to its consumers and to its investors. Um, impacts of those mentioned could also be unwanted media attention if you're called out in the press, um, and then as a worst case, you know, that, that damage reputation actually happening. So finally, moving on, liability. So again, this isn't something that necessarily exists right now, but this is most likely to be reaction in most uh, most likely to be in re reaction to changes in physical and transition risks and what we're expected to disclose as companies. Um, this will result in potentially entities seeking compensation from said company. Um, and as laws and regulations and importantly case law changes and evolves, the instance of probability of liabilities arising for an organisation, you know, is likely to increase. Um, there are a fair few interesting cases out there at the moment where um, companies or pension funds or things like this are being taken are being um, taken to court or being sued by other parties because of their um, position on climate change. There's quite there's quite an interesting case down in Australia where the pension funds um, their preparedness for climate change isn't necessarily um, as, as, as wanted by certain investors. Um, but yeah, that's, that's something that's very new. But if you think about current legislation on environmental risk like contaminated land, climate change is something, and oh, sorry, and contribution to climate change could, could be something that's dealt with retrospectively. That, there's a, that's, a very, that's a very realistic potential case where, you know, companies who are known to have contributed badly to climate change emissions could be retrospectively punished for, or, you know, or punished for, for, the, for that cause, causation. Um, and maybe financially, uh, there may be financial penalties for that. But again, this is all up in the air until until these regulation laws come out. We don't really know. But the advice that Mark Carney, um, former chancellor of the Bank of England, said that it's extremely important to change now to get ahead of impending regulation um, instead of having to react to it. Because the more you get ahead, and the better prepared you are for the future, and, you, and the lower your risk will be. So. Um, looking at landmark, um, what we are looking at doing in the area to kind of to help out practitioners with this. So we're already, as I said, I mentioned earlier, we're already helping lenders understand risk um, and the impact of climate change on their portfolios. And we do this through landmarks valuation services um, business area. 
and we've been taking um, baseline risk, applying logic using um, UK CPA team, which again Sally mentioned earlier, which is the most authoritative data on climate change and whether patterns expected for the UK available. Um, we've been taking that data and harnessing that to provide indication of how risk may change um, across someone's mortgage back book, across portfolios of properties, um, through a scenario based analysis uh, methodology, um, which they're expected to do. So, effectively, stress testing, taking different scenarios. Um, applying different epochs to it to see how risk may change so that um, these businesses and these lenders are more prepared for where their risk may, may be to inform decision making. Um, but our focus, so looking at the, the legal business area and the services we provide to lawyers, um, focusing on physical risk is something that seems naturally, um, naturally something that, we, that we, can, we can do and something we can achieve something good in the area. And again, you know, in the UK, flooding is already something that's a big, big problem. And that's something that's only expected to really get worse to what degree we don't know based on emission scenario but something that's likely to increase either in severity or frequency and so other other risks that are, are deemed suitable or sorry not suitable relevant for the uk you know river tidal surface water flooding as i said but also windstorms um potentially damaged building heat stress so in seven months yes subsidence could be a problem but also if our buildings aren't geared up to withstand higher temperatures or are not suitable under high temperatures then there's gonna to have to be some mitigation alleviation around the property stock to, to manage that away from defaulting straight to air conditioning because obviously that will increase your emissions your emissions output um, and as I mentioned earlier drought um, how are we going to sustainably source water for the long term to 2100 going forward you know green in terms of commercial buildings grey water use and rainwater harvesting seems like an approach that a lot of, lots of businesses and lots of buildings already take so retrofitting things like that may also be um, of relevance but the two key questions that that we hopefully can be in a position to answer soon is you know what is the current baseline risk that we're facing at a property um, and what could it be in the future but then does that change does that change in risk alter the perceived value of the property so really they're the key questions that oh sorry or a perceived value of the property by a potential purchaser and they're the key questions that we help out with with current risk and we think that it's something that is, is definitely doable looking at future risk and climate change um, the reason being is obviously, yeah, as I said, we have products in the market as well that help out with, with current flood risk. And it just seems like the natural step um, to look at risk um, for climate change, for kind of climate vulnerability screening in through very varied levels of assessment to account for climate change. seems like the next step, the natural next step for us to, for us to take. And that's something we're looking at at the moment. Um, what it often requires is a statistical analysis of the RCP 18 data that that's available to us but you know that that weather pattern data is vital to providing a solution to this area and because we're already experts in flood risk this is this is the, the next direction we'll probably we'll probably head in um and just an idea of what we're thinking you know current current flood risk to set as a baseline to say this is your current um risk of the property based upon current conditions you know this is data we're all familiar with whether that's you know more commonly used environment agency data on river 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 tidal and surface water risk but then also taking the statistical analysis and working out how that probability could increase in the future. You know, that's the direction we're looking, we're looking to take and the focus will be on um, frequency, the frequency of flooding in line with you know, current risk bandings um, because that's the way risk is communicated now as it is. Um, but with that as well, because, because this is unknown, you know, we think scenario analysis and st stress testing, which banks are doing at the moment, is also vital and key because otherwise we've got to draw a line in the sand. Um, which might not be to, to a market's tolerance to risk. So scenario analysis as being recommended to lenders is, is, is vital in, in providing a, a full picture of what risk could be or look like a property in the long run. So just to quickly summarise on what we discussed. So um, as Sally said at the beginning, you know, climate change and climate risks are already being felt across the UK and in the world. You know, there's areas of the country that are naturally susceptible to risk more than others and are going to feel the consequences of um, changing climate and things like rising sea levels a lot quicker than, than some other than some other areas but inevitably as they do now physical risks um, and transition risks will impact upon property and these physical trans transition risks will impact property value and require mit mitigation um, the way the markets respond will be a driver to that obviously such as the insurance market which is an unknown at the moment but this change is effectively happening now and there are already property markets um, and companies looking at ways to incorporate climate change analysis and climate change risk into due diligence and so therefore you know speaking to a couple of law firms in, in, in London and some clients you know the feeling is is that because of what's going to happen 
or was expected to happen in 2022 with the green finance strategy, you know, it is very likely this could form part of pre access due diligence, either for some clients who are cautious, who are, who are adhering to 2050 targets, or just generally across the board. But effectively, the message is also that, you know, this is something we're very aware of, and we're looking at creative solutions to help out with this. Um, and that's it. So I just want to say thank you very much for attending and listening to us. Um, hopefully it was clear and you got something useful out of it. Um, contact details are in the slide in front of you for myself and Sally. Um, just want to say a big thank you to Bristol Law Society for inviting us on to talk today. Um, really appreciate your time. And just one more person who isn't here today, but is Landmark's key account director down in the southwest of England is Ali, Ali Parsons. Um, so if you want to speak to her about anything, going on she's also a great content to have but yeah thank you very much for your time thank you mark and uh thank you sally um we did have um a couple of questions sent in in advance of the session um which i will um just pick up now for the benefit of um for everyone else um so the first question we had in was um how secure is investment in green infrastructure for commercial property investors um do you have a particular view on on that mark uh it's not really a market that i'm too aware of it's not something i, I, yeah. I know too much about um green technology is always in changing it's always changing it's always improving you know solar panels and wind farms are pretty much the energy of the future across the uk and um have had subsidies in the past and i think there's there's been talk of government bringing back certain subsidies for these things as well so um in terms of securing, I don't think you know, green technologies is only going to get better, better and better. So uh, I know records have been broken across the year as well. Again, I don't have the facts to hand about energy being generated from green technologies in, across certain days. And I think we had the longest duration without any coal power, any fossil fuel power this year. So um, I don't think there's any real security issues with it because it's already you know, meeting demand. <laughs> yeah it, it seems to be to be demanded as anyway and that's only going to improve and i suppose the key thing will be um from a commercial property standpoint or res residential property standpoint will be really harnessing and, and making it really efficient at the property level so however that is you know that's not my area expertise but however yeah. that is <laughs> that's going to be the key challenge is how do we get these these items where we, we, we're telling people to install when we need them to install how do we make them as efficient as an energy generating potential as possible no, thank you, Mark. Um, and then the other question that came in was, um, which is directed at, at, at both of you, um, what is the most exciting development in the field of environmental law? Um, uh, I, I can go first, Sally. The thing that I yeah. think would have been very, very interesting recently, it's not a big thing by all means, but it's an acknowledgement of climate change in environmental permitting. So before we're issuing a license, the EA um, will require an assessment of the area, the area's flood, current flood risk baseline, but also how that might change over, you know, a certain length of period. And that acknowledgement, I think that um, it's mainly I think, from a contamination standpoint, you know, if you're a waste transfer site and you're storing some used oil, used chemicals and you flood and that gets into the into the environment, that's a, that's a huge, that's a huge problem. So I think that acknowledgement, um, that climate change is something that needs to be accounted for um when issuing current licenses is, 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 a, is a good is a very positive step yeah i was going to say the same thing but also um with air quality as well um we've obviously had the recent case of ella who um, it's been said that was um exposed to illegal limits um of air pollution so that's another thing that i think will start to evolve Thank you both for you. Um, I don't think there was any more questions in the Q&A unless anyone wants to, to pop one in now. Um, but uh, yeah, no, just to say thank you again, um, Sally and Mark for uh, really, really interesting talks. Uh, really appreciate it. Um, and, and thank you everyone else for uh, joining us um, for the webinar today. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you.